Coming up next on the GeoTrack podcast. The main issue um, that we face is rip currents. Rip currents is the number one killer of, of people in the beach. It's the, it is responsible for 80% of the rescues we make here locally and nationally and internationally in the beach environment. So rip currents is our number one threat when you come to the beach. Everything else pales in comparison. We have been in the midst of a record-breaking heat wave this summer in much of the U.S. as temperatures climb into the 90s and even the triple digits in some parts of our country. Millions of people are visiting beaches to escape the heat and cool off in the water. Many do not realize that the coastal environment is very complex and has a lot of hidden dangers that can threaten their lives. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Howe. Welcome to the GeoTrek podcast. This is episode 38 of the podcast titled Beach Safety in Complex Coastal Environments. Our guest is Chief Peter Davis, an award-winning leader in the field of lifesaving and the head of Galveston Island Beach Patrol in Galveston, Texas. If you love getting out in nature and exploring the coast, you'll find this episode very applicable as it's packed with a lot of practical advice. A bit about the podcast, GeoTrek travels the world to find stories about the relationship between people and nature. Our stories investigate the impact of extreme weather, disasters, and hazards on individuals and communities. Our goal is to help you understand better how the world works so you can take actions to make yourself, your family, and your community more resilient to all the extremes that Mother Nature can throw at us. Hey, before we get into this episode, we have a favor to ask of you. We would really appreciate it if you would take a minute to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Your subscription helps us mark progress, which enables us to make professional partnerships moving forward and ensures many more episodes of the podcast in the future. Now let's jump in the water with Chief Davis to learn more from his nearly 40 years of experience in lifesaving. Oh, and don't worry about a wetsuit. It's Galveston in July, and the water temp today is 88 degrees. Let's dive into this episode with a more thorough introduction of this week's guest. Chief Peter Davis heads up both the Galveston Island Beach Patrol and the Park Board Police Department. He began working for Beach Patrol in 1983. He currently volunteers as Secretary General of the Americas Region of the International Lifesaving Federation, as well as the President of the United States Lifesaving Association. In 2017, he was awarded the title of Knight in the Order of Lifesaving by the International Lifesaving Federation, and in 2019, he was given the Paragon Award and inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame for the category of water safety. Chief Davis, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast. With all these accomplishments as a lifeguard and water sports athlete, I have to ask you, you know, how did you get so passionate about the water? Was this something that started for you as a child? I would qualify that with aging athlete, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, no, I, I grew up in a beach family, so you know I'm a seventh generation Galvestonian, and apparently my grandparents' grandparents went to the beach all the time too. So they, I, I hear these stories about these old German ladies with like china and bedspreads out on the beach, you know, bringing their their lunch out there. So my grandma was telling me that her you know parents brought her out there and stuff like that. So I grew up you know in the water. I, I started surfing at ten, but I, before that I was skimboarding. And we you know my mom was a beach girl. We went to the beach all the time. When you're a surfer and you're coming up, and I started doing a little competition. I was on like the ball high school surf team for a while. And um, you know what you really wanted to do then was be a beach lifeguard. That was the, the that was the most coveted job you know on the island, from what I could tell. And you you really you started lifeguarding in 1983, right? Yeah, 83. So, yeah. Could you explain a little bit of, like what was that like in, in that time? I mean, is it different than it is today? It was, it was so yeah. I think lifeguarding you know really shifted um, drastically in about just after the turn of the century because it was instead of protecting people in boats we were protecting people in the water and it's really interesting like how little it's changed through the years I mean we have technology um, you know that's really improved but I think the big difference is Leroy Colombo the you know supposedly the greatest lifeguard of all time from Galveston Texas and has in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most saves he had a motto um, modeled after the Texas Ranger motto but it was one beach one lifeguard and I think the big difference between then and now isn't the rescue techniques. They have changed a little bit, but basically you bring something that floats out there and try to save yourself and them on the way back in. Um, but it's that we work so much in a team now compared to the old days. Like we really are um, layers and layers of protection, not just for the beachgoers, but for our own staff. 
Well, just this morning, as we met to record this podcast, a lot of the lifeguards were coming in from morning training, right? And you said they were doing not only physical training, but a lot of times also uh, personal skills, communication skills, things like that. Yeah, we have a um, like a pretty robust training session. So once they qualify to be a lifeguard and they meet the swim standards, they go through our 100 hours of training to be one. Then whenever they work every day, they have a, a training session and that training session is broken up. It's about three quarter physical. So it's running, swimming, rescue board swim rescue techniques stuff like that and then uh, and then about a quarter of it is is um like almost a classroom kind of session so there'd be hand skills cpr training leadership communicating with it you know the public like all that kind of stuff you were saying as well a lot of times they're the first first people that the public interacts with right on the beach yeah we consider ourselves the first line of uh, tourist relations so we we're all certified tourist ambassadors and the full-time staff and then the the lifeguards themselves receive sort of a a boiled down version of that in their training and in their recurrent training as well because we interact so much with you know over seven million tourists a year Mm -hmm. and some of this training can actually take people really far as far as you were explaining uh there's like nationals for is it the national life-saving association right yeah so there's a there's a uh, there's an organization called the united states life-saving association um which sets the lifeguard standards for beach you know guarding or for open water guarding and you know they do a bunch of stuff public education certification all that uh, awards but one of the big things we also do is life-saving sport which is a whole sport unto itself and so basically the same skills that we use when we're making rescues out here you know on a daily basis are incorporated into these the these these different types of athletic events so every year we have a different national training there's a regional one every year you know we're in the gulf coast region here Um, and then every two years there's a group called the international life-saving federation and they put on a world life-saving championship so this year it'll be in rigatoni in italy but it rotates every two years as well so as far as life-saving as a sport basically it's all these amazing lifeguards coming together in one place and then doing competitions where they're they're swimming running doing uh, exactly. skills on boards things like that right yeah exactly and 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 this and all those kind of tie into what the actual skill set of the guards are so it's the only sport that saves your life <laughs> is what we say but it's also uh you know it's it's a little bit different we're in, it's an olympic game sport now but not in the olympics yet um, but, you know, we kind of bill it as, look, these are working lifeguards that are out here. They're not professional athletes, you know, all the time. And so these skills are the ones they're using at their job also. Mm-hmm. Chief Davis, you've won a lot of national and international awards for your accomplishments as an athlete, as an instructor. Uh, which award means the most to you and why is that? That's a hard question, right? But, so there's, yeah, I mean, I, I've never really been the top tier competitor, you know, like at the international level. Um, and I've won a few, you know, I usually do okay in age groups now, and I used to do okay in the, at the national level. Um, but I think the biggest award to me that I've ever gotten was, I, it was probably, I was knighted in the Order of Lifesaving um, from the International Lifesaving Federation. So that's a pretty big, like a kind of a lifetime achievement award. And that had a lot to do with developing lifesaving programs here in the, in the America's region, like working in South and Central America to develop lifesaving programs, you know, outside of the U.S. and stuff like that. And I, I think that the reason that award to me is so cool is that, I, you know, this is not stuff you ever do alone. So every th- piece of that was done in a team. So, you know, I was sort of, re- I felt like getting that award on behalf of all the people I work with in Venezuela or Mexico or here in the States or wherever, you know, to do some of the pretty cool things that we ended up being able to do as a group. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm just starting to see the value of these international collaborations as a lot of the folks I met this morning were from Colombia and different, you know, a lot of Spanish speakers, English speakers, life-saving in general, it seems like it is very collaborative and has become quite international as well. It, it really is. And it's, it's you know, it's a small world because it's, it's a relatively new profession. If you look at the other public safety groups, police, fire, and EMS, they've been around a long time. And we've only had professional life saving really, really since the 50s or so, where we've really, you know, done it on an international level and that kind of stuff. And we definitely did stuff before, but we didn't have national organizations around the world like we do now. And we didn't have one group, the International Life Saving Federation, that ties it all together. And so it's really neat, like a lot of the people that are my peers, you know, they're people that kind of run or are involved in um, their national federations, like in different countries. And this is like all over the planet, which has been a real, for me, a gift because not just personally, it's really nice to, for me to have this connection yeah. with people that are, you know, doing the same thing all over. But also, like, there's so much stuff that I was able to learn um, from those efforts that ended up coming back here and is integrated into our program here. I'm really proud of what we do here in Galveston. I think it's probably one of the best, um, uh, you know, lifeguard 
organizations in the in the world, from what I've seen, and definitely pound for pound, you know, with the budget we work with and stuff like that, we are probably the most efficient, you know, in, in that way. But you know, a lot of these techniques we have came from other places that we didn't invent them here. I mean, they all, not just within the U.S., but you know, all over. Oh, the I world. see. So there might be something they're doing in Venezuela or something they're doing in Mexico that you're like, wait, we want to incorporate that back in Galveston. Absolutely. I'll give you a really good example. Like when we started training, uh, we have a sister city in Veracruz, Mexico. So we started a inter- inter- interchange with those guys. And so we go down there every year usually and run some kind of class or we kind of help them run a class or we kind of, you know, work, you know, with them to facilitate what they're doing now because they, they're pretty developed now. We were, you know, we thought we were going to go impart all the wisdom kind of, you know, like we were going to be the ones that know everything. And they, you know, because they had learned everything they knew at that point from Guadianos de la Bahia, which is Baywatch, and from fishing, you know, people that fish for a living. So like that was their, their two knowledge sources because there's no professional lifeguard programs around Veracruz, right? So we went and we were, we did help them a lot. I mean, we, we taught them all about, you know, you can't just have shiny jet skis. You have to actually have a swim standard. You know, here's, some, here's the techniques and that kind of stuff. But I think we learned a lot more from them, you know, at the end of the day. And what we really learned was um, way more about collaboration. They're working with a lot fewer resources than we are. And at the States at that time, when we started that program, we're all pretty cashed up. I mean, relatively speaking. And, and that's changed now. Like now we're really codependent on each other to make this work because we all have had budget, you know, issues, right? But, you know, seeing how they collaborated, you know, 10 or 15 different organizations would come together when they had a big thing like Easter, like Semana Santa, where millions of people are at their beaches and stuff like that. So coming back here, just sort of unlocking that part of your brain. Um, after we had Hurricane Ike here and we were tasked with the then mayor, Light and Thomas, me and the fire chief, hey, figure out how to do this. You know, like how can you all better respond to this? Well, it really all of a sudden was like, it's so clear. They do it in Veracruz on a daily basis. Like, they bring in people to, you know, help with water safety. They co-train. They, you know, they work together all the time on this stuff because they have to because of the resource issue. And now as our resources have gotten more scarce, we're relying more and more on our partners and they on us for that same reason. So we formed Galveston Marine Response police fire ems jamaica beach fire the sheriff's office you know there's a bunch of groups in there and we really like play in the same sandbox really well and we and when it comes down to like you in trouble in a boat your family needs help offshore whatever you can be guaranteed that you know we're going to be on the same page when we're all coming to get you well yeah and now on a daily basis when we have big calls that are multi-agency calls we all work really together because we form that structure in yeah. advance so that's, that's I, I, i've seen things. similar things like I, i've worked a lot in southeast louisiana and coastal mississippi after katrina mm-hmm. and just hearing people's stories of we absolutely had to come together as all these different agencies there was no way one group was going to do this on their own absolutely you know? very un-american idea. yeah exactly yeah. right but but this collaborative community type of idea. Chief David, I, one of the biggest blessings since I've lived here in Galveston are my friends on Beach Patrol. I've made a bunch and I'm always, I'm a big nerd about understanding the coastal environment. I love nature and the environment. So I've just let them kind of teach me what they know about the coast. And one of the things that I've consistently picked up, I mean, we get a huge amount of people coming from Houston, from Dallas, from a lot of the Plain States. A lot of times the, the first beach they want to come to is Galveston. So we get millions of people here every year. And one of the things my friends on Beach Patrol kind of help me see is that a lot of times people come here. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining the water maybe looks pretty pretty calm and you know they can they can get in there just kind of assuming that they're getting into a swimming pool or that their their six-year-old is getting in a swimming pool but they're not it's the ocean the gulf uh caribbean sea these places are not a swimming pool Uh, what are some of the hidden dangers that blindside people when they when they come to salt water and they're thinking of it as a swimming pool but it's really not yeah i think the big the big picture what you're talking about is that it's a complex environment, very complicated. And so the main thing is, you know, you want to keep your common sense and, and be alert. And I always say, don't check your brain at the causeway because smart people kind of get real dumb real quick when they're having fun sometimes. And so that's a big part of it. But the main issue um, that we face is rip currents. Rip currents is the number one killer of, of people in the beach. It's the, it is responsible for 80% of the rescues we make here locally and nationally and internationally in the beach environment. So rip currents is our number one threat when you come to the beach. Everything else pales in comparison. Could you explain a little bit about that? Like what is a rip current? Mm-hmm. Why is it dangerous? And what, pe- what can people do? And, and put it in real simple terms, a rip current is, it's basically a stream or a mini river of water that runs more or less perpendicular to shore out to sea. 
It doesn't go forever. It just goes, you know, depending 50 or 100 yards max usually or something like that. But it runs out. And so what that means is if there's a sandy bottom, it's going to take sand with it. It's going to form a trough underneath it. So you picture a river running out, then it gets deep underneath it, which makes more water go that way because water is essentially pretty lazy. It's going to follow the path of least resistance. And it's self-perpetuating, so it can get stronger because of that. In the upper Texas coast, uh, the main threat is near a structure like a pier or a jetty. Rock groins, of course, are, are our main thing here in Galveston. And near those rock groins, every day of the year, there is some type of rip current, and it's always a little bit of a drop-off right there. Um, when it's rough like it is today, you'll see those, those, those troughs get deeper, and the current will get stronger. Um, and, that, and then, you know, if you understand it, then you can understand how to protect yourself from it. So the number one thing you want to do is avoid being in that area. Uh, we've got plenty of signage here. We've got lifeguard towers in the area. If you swim near a lifeguard, you know, they'll keep you away from that and they'll remind you. But you also want to realize that, you know, sometimes people are going to get caught in there without unaware. So it can happen. And so if you're ever that person that unfortunately gets caught in a rip current you need to understand it doesn't pull you down there's no water that pulls you underwater in the beach it's not like a hydraulic in a river or anything like that it's just going to pull you out and so if you know that then you know what to do you'll know to relax and float just go with it it'll take you out eventually you're probably going to make it back to shore if you can yell for help or wave that'd be great so we can find you and get to you Um, but just stay calm and relax as best you can if you're a super good swimmer and you can try swimming parallel to shore toward breaking waves a lot of times that'll work as well because where waves break it's shallow and so if you go to where the wave where you see white water you'll be able, you'll probably be able to stand up and walk in but the main thing you want to do is just you know to relax and float so if you're a strong swimmer maybe maybe try to swim out of it but uh, in general probably the best thing is people just to relax stay calm relax and, and let go. it take them out yeah. and they'll be okay hopefully we, we say go with the flow just just let it let it do its thing and and you know then the other thing is you don't want to go in after somebody you know i think we have a huge percentage i, I, I want to say it's 30 percent or so so of drownings in open water are double drownings or triple drownings where a would-be good Samaritan goes and tries to save somebody. And it's heartbreaking because a lot of the times the person who was originally in trouble gets gets saved and the person who went for them dies. I've seen it happen a, a bunch of times here, and I read stories all the time all around the world about this happening. So you don't want to go in after them unless you're someone like our lifeguards who have the tools and the training and the fitness level to do that. Uh, what you want to do is throw something that floats to them, extend something to them if they're close enough to the shore or to, an ob- you know, to a pier or dock or something like that um, but at the end of the of each jetty in Galveston we have these rescue boxes with round ring buoys and throw bags and you can grab that throw bag and throw the ring buoy and you can pull them up on the rocks make it cut up but they'll be a lot better than you know the alternative and it sounds like not only is it a current carrying you away but also this is scouring out some of the sand making that area deeper like a, a bit of a trough right yeah it's and and then, you know if you have a day that's really rough and that trough gets really deep and those troughs can get to be like 20 25 feet you know near these groins they can be extremely deep we've worked around these where we're trying to find people down there and we can't even free dive down to the bottom of them so you know be aware that 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 can change and so one thing that can happen is suddenly it's calm the next day the wind dies and the water just goes flat that hole is still there that trough is still going to be there i see so on a rough day the trough forms the next day's calm you're not thinking be, anything yeah, and there yeah. still might be a trough there. and weirdly if it stays calm for a few days that hole stays but it takes a little bit of you know motion little energy in the water for it to jiggle that sand back in and fill it back in somewhat so i mean it doesn't really matter how deep it is once it's over your head but it's just an interesting thing to know how that forms and how and why it changes so much and why you can't really think well i was fine here when i came here a week ago um why why is this lifeguard telling me to get out of this area now or why if i'm outside of the no swim sign you know away from those rocks is the lifeguard telling me to go two to three times that distance on a certain day when they didn't tell me that last time so bear with us and understand that there are reasons that these guards are moving you yeah. you know where they where you're the going. coastal environment so dynamic right it, sometimes it's changing day by day it changes all the time i mean it, if you look at the ends of the island the san Luis pass and the ship channel that current scours out that sand so fast and on a daily basis it changes almost hourly it changes and so you may go out there one one moment and it's like waist deep and there's no current and four hours later you go out there and it's like 15 feet deep and the current's ripping you and pulling you offshore so that's why those areas are illegal and why we have signage and why we try to do the best we can to keep people out of that I know a lot of people when they come to the beach they're just thinking sharks, sharks and more sharks and it seems like you're saying rip currents are the big thing and then as far as other animals there's probably other animals that people would encounter much more frequently like jellyfish, Portuguese man of war stingrays, things like this as well Absolutely, there's there's a whole bunch and you, you know as long as you understand 
understand that if rip currents and traffic accidents are probably your biggest risk when you come to the beach. But once you get past that, there are risks out there. They're just so much, so much smaller than the big risks. But yeah, there are sharks in the in the ocean, and there are stingrays, and there are catfish, and there are other things, crabs that can bite you, and jellyfish that can sting you, and stuff like that. But generally, they're not nearly the threat that people think they are. I think they're more of a discomfort. And I, I think it's part of the joy of going to the beach too, is that you're not in a water park and you're not in a pool. You're out there in the natural environment. It's not your home. It's theirs. And so you have to be aware, you know, of what's out there. And if you think like they think a little bit, you'll be a lot safer. So for example, human, don't just stomp through the water thinking you're the only thing out there because there are critters that live out there. If you step on the back of a catfish or in the back of a stingray, they're going to do what they can to protect themselves. And so you want to just not do that. Shuffle your feet when you go out there, move slowly, you know, don't just force yourself on that environment. The only thing that really won't move away from you out there that I know of is just a jellyfish because they're they're the only thing that might just drift right into you. Uh, and we put warning flags up when the, you know there's higher chances of getting stung. What about if there's a big uh, you know, colony or what, a big group of jellyfish, Portuguese men of war, people get caught in that or something? Is that, I mean, how dangerous can that be? You know, people think jellyfish and man of war are super dangerous because they can really hurt. Uh, you know, I've been stung up thousands of times, and I know that um, you know, like a man of war can really almost debilitate you. It hurts really bad. But the, the interesting thing about that is compared to, let's say, a bee sting or even an ant bite or something like that, that sting is completely topical. It's just on the surface of your skin. So it's not in your bloodstream or anything like that. And so if you're allergic to everything in the world and you, you know, get stung by jellyfish and you think you're going to have an allergic reaction, if you feel like vomity or crampy or something like that that's the pain and the fear talking most likely it's extremely rare to have an allergic reaction to a jellyfish sting so usually it's fairly superficial very very much so and but the treatment is fairly simple it's rinse the water the area with saline saline will not let the rest of those stinging cells that haven't fired yet on that tentacle sting you so you're not making the sting worse basically a saltwater rinse yeah, you saltwater rinse, saline. If you don't have any official saline, saltwater is good. Saltwater rinse. Make sure the tentacles aren't on you. Get those tentacles off in a way that doesn't sting you. So a glove or a napkin or whatever, pull them off. If they're even on you, most of the time they're not. And then re-rinse. And then at that point, that sting is, you know, whatever, wherever you stung, you've been stung, but it's not going to get worse. And so then you're just at pain management. So you, ice topical anesthetic whatever you want to use or just kind of gut it out because it's going to go away in 15 minutes usually if it's a minor sting i was surprised to hear stories of i mean we know the in the coastal environment there are a lot of races there'll be marathons 10ks triathlons i was surprised to hear some stories uh, just from different coastal environments of triathletes getting into trouble in the swim version so obviously a triathlon (laughs) you're swimming you're running you're biking and that surprised me because i picture these people as elite athletes that would be like never have trouble in in the swim portion do you get the feeling sometimes like maybe people have trained in a pool and then the, when they get out th- here in the salt water it's it's a lot different and maybe some of the people aren't fully prepared for it or like wh- yeah. what are the dangers there if uh, i mean I, we you know we, we we do the water safety for the iron man every year here in galveston and we've done it for a number of years you would be shocked if you came on the jet ski with us or or out in the water with us how many people we bring to shore during that race i mean it is not unusual for us to make 40 to 60 rescues during one of those races where we're bringing people back to the dock only because they panic or only because they exceeded their physical limits because you can touch the bottom of a pool and swim you know the same distance and stop on the wall doesn't mean you can jump in cold water wearing a wetsuit with people climbing on top of you (laughs) and not panic and so I I think that you, you don't see experienced racers need help very often at all in those races but it's usually people that are first second third time triathletes you know that are out there trying to do it and they're pretty good runner and they're pretty good biker and they think they're just going to gut their way through the swim and i think that's a really critical thing it's really important to train in the same environment that you perform in whether you're talking about rescues or races yeah. i see what you're saying and so that person might be uh, tracking on their smartphone or their watch and be like oh i just swam a mile and a half in a pool <laughs> but maybe it was broken up with stops or they again they they're alone in the lane they can always stand it's very different right. than current waves other crowded people it, it sounds like the environment could be really different than what they're used to well i think you as an athlete probably are really aware of the, how much the your big muscle in your brain can oh, yeah. affect your performance i mean you can be amazing physically and it just 
totally crater on these races because you psych yourself out or something like that. Or one little kick to the stomach while you're out there because you're in a pod of people can really debilitate people and they can panic. And stuff I used like to do that. a lot of like long distance snowshoe racing. Like in Alaska, some of the races would be minus 37, minus 39. Oh, so, yeah. But you, you can't train in the indoor track and then show up at race day. You, you yeah. have to be out there in the spruce forest training when it's 28 below. I mean, you just you have to get used to that environment where it's just very normal. So I'd imagine similar out here, like the more if you're training for something like that, getting some saltwater time is probably almost uh you know critical i think that's probably a really good analogy uh, i mean being it from the ocean and stuff when i used to do triathlon i used to do way better than i should have in the swims Be, you know people way faster than me i, I could beat them in the swims you're just so used to the yeah because i was i was super comfortable in that part of the race and so you know it's really it, it really shows you the mental power you know of, of, of what this is and I, I think the same thing for people that go to the beach all the time they're familiar with this but a lot of our tourists a lot of those seven and a half million people down here it's their first time at the beach and so you know the smallest thing going wrong can really can really be scary and so that's why it's really important that you pick a lifeguarded area to swim near what about people getting a little bit offshore in a kayak a stand-up paddle board a, a jet ski a small boat what kind of issues can they run into so we we get real busy sometimes on offshore wind days when people get blown offshore whether they're on a float or they're maybe on an sup or something like that and they can't get back to shore you forget that like when you get a little bit away from the shoreline that chop gets a lot more pronounced and you kind of really and the wind picks up and you know once you're farther from shore and so people can get themselves in trouble by getting off and not being able to get back and so we don't allow floats in the water inflatables during those offshore wind days for that exact reason because we'll chase them all day long otherwise you mean someone's out in one of those really big rafts or something yeah, big big yeah, float for their yeah. kid you're saying an off a wind blowing offshore it's going to blow their kid out to deep water it, it will and it's happened a bunch of times in fact we've had people that we couldn't find for a while when they went out there that you know we luckily found like at an oil platform or something like that and so um you know i think that that's a big one so we, and we do a lot of um, response to like catamarans that flip and can't get back over, or jet skis that break out in the water, like that kind of stuff. Our jurisdiction is the beachfront up to three miles offshore. And then after that, we share that with the Coast Guard. And so uh, we work a lot with Coast Guard offshore. We work a lot with the other Galveston Marine response groups in the bays. You know, it happens a lot more than people realize um, where, where, you know, you don't have a plan. You, you're having fun. You want to go farther out. And all of a sudden you realize, well, I didn't really calculate that this wind's going to be blowing me out or this current's taking me out or whatever like that. So it, it's a really good lesson about not exceeding your limitations and realizing your limitations are probably not what you think they are if you're in an environment that you're not familiar with. Yeah, and it's probably good to remember too. If 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 you have to fight a wind to get back in, that might be a concern, right? Because <laughs> it's it's going to be easy to go out on those days, but a lot harder to get yeah, back. Yeah, we're in. all we're all full on the way. I, I just a very quick example. You know, I raced this surf ski thing. It's like a long kayak. I learned very quickly that you know in the spring particularly. Um, but now all the time, I always have a compass on my watch. You know, it used to be a little clip on thing or whatever, because you get offshore and that fog pops up and there's you get no caught wind. In the fog. You can't even use the sun to navigate sometimes. And it can happen really quickly when a fog bank rolls in. And so I've actually had to use a compass to get back to shore a couple of times when I exceeded my own limits. I should have been staying really close to shore. So, uh, you know, I, I can tell you a bunch of other stories about guards that jumped in the water without wetsuits in the winter or spring because they thought it was a quick rescue, ended up out there for two hours. We had to rescue them you know that kind of stuff too so i mean it, it really is you want to do all your planning in advance and kind of think of those contingencies before you kind of get in and, and go too far from yeah shore. that makes a lot of, a lot of sense a lot of times we get these pop-up thunderstorms as well and especially in the summer that just can come out of nowhere i mean what happens if someone gets caught in one of those um, I, I think, you know, one of our big things in the summertime here in the Texas coast is lightning. And so these storms pop up really quickly. Uh, we may not even know. We may not even have forecasts that showed there was going to be rain that day. And all of a sudden you've got a little cell moving in with lightning or sometimes a funnel cloud or something like that. And so we, we, we worked on a, a plan nationally through USLA uh, with, with sort of a agency policies about lightning. And so we follow kind of what the, that national standard is now. But if that cell moves within or lightning comes within 10 miles of shore we clear the water we notify the public and we get the guard out of that lifeguard tower uh, so they'll be safe and so you know and then we do it the same thing we reverse it when it's 10 miles away from us and so that we can get everybody back in there and stuff like that and so sometimes people won't get out of the water you know like that and, and that becomes sort of an issue but it is something to think about when you're here is that you know, lightning is a, is a pretty big danger, um, and you really want to make sure that you don't think you can go underneath an umbrella or a tarp to be safe. Um, the only really two places that are safe from lightning is in an enclosed building or an enclosed car. And, and you know, 
we all usually a lot of us have cars with us when we're at the beach and we can jump in that car and ride it out in your car and just wait till it passes it's funny we'll clear the beach and all of a sudden everybody goes underneath their tarp and we're like uh you're way worse than you were when you're out there in the water <laughs> under that tarp you know but is it because the tarp is a higher point uh, is it it's higher and it's got metal you know it's got aluminum so they just frame. went under one of these yeah, uh yeah. tarps with with, uh, with a metal frame. frame so they basically went under a lightning rod to and made safety. themselves a lot more vulnerable <laughs> yeah, than they exactly. were how much more difficult is it to make a rescue at night versus in the day? Fog and night are like the two nightmares for us. So, yeah, like, you know, at night, too, we, we don't have resources. So we may have one, if we're lucky, two lifeguards on call. Uh, and, I mean, some of the, the you know, we don't have time for war stories, thank God. But, some, you know, most of my war stories are that, like a nighttime call, going out, somebody's hanging on the side of a fishing pier pole, you know, and you have to go get them and find them and get them off, or they're stuck under the causeway somewhere, and you can, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's really, really difficult to operate, you know, without visibility. And we we do have some tools, like we have a boat that has, you know, radar and you know that kind of stuff. But even that is really, it's not like anything like daytime. In daytime, you just it's so much easier to operate. And we do have a lot of after hours calls where people are stuck on the south jetty somebody jumped off the causeway that you know there's all this kind of stuff that we 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 deal with you mentioned night and fog are your two worst nightmares i have to ask this there there has to be in your in your many decades of experience there has to be a night where it was dark and foggy and almost (laughs) an impossible rescue and maybe it turned out can you think of any like that that actually turned out favorable a good ending but it, it was a shot in the dark you know for- yeah yeah i mean there was a guy i mean I, I can think of a couple ones but there was maybe a guy i remember one time there was a guy that somebody saw jump off the causeway like he stopped his car left in the middle of the lane and jumped off the causeway and they were like what do we do and it was one of those nights you're talking about it was like february it's like 38 degrees it was dark and you know that kind of stuff and there was a like it had been a front, so there was warm water, so there was steam. You know, it wasn't really fog, but it was steam coming off the water. And I remember, like, being alone trying to figure out how to do this. This is pre-GMR, right? So we didn't have all the different groups and stuff, and it was just me out there. And I remember thinking, okay, what are, you know, you kind of look at what your highest likelihood of success are, and you kind of roll with that and just, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So my hi- highest probability of success was not to just go out there on some boat, you know. Was, so I took a rescue board and I paddled under the causeway and checked pole by pole. And I found the guy up on one of the platforms. He had tried to kill himself and then he changed his mind. Once he hit that cold water, he changed his mind and he was just shivering and freezing, you know, up on one of those poles. And so I was able to put him on the front of the rescue board and bring him back to the marina and EMS met me and, you know, they took it from there and stuff like that and the police. So there, there, there are like, we have a lot of, you know, really big luck stories, but I think, you know, those pale in comparison to the potential for bad things that happen when people don't consider those conditions. And there have been times when we have to just say, this is too dangerous to put someone in. And it's a sure, really sure. hard call to do as a lifeguard boss, you know, or whatever, like get off the streets. The wind's yeah. more than 40, sure, sure. you know, to come, protect your staff yeah, and your yeah, lifeguards yeah. as well. You know, something I learned from that story too, this isn't just physical ability that you have to get out there and save someone. There's also this mental side of like, okay, it's night. I'm out in the causeway. I can't see much at all. Where do I even start looking? And then you were thinking the, the peers are the poles under the, under right, the bridge. Right. 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 And, that, and that's why like our full-time staff, the ones that work year round, which is most of our supervisors, they 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 have like incredible amounts of training and they've got all this common sense because they've all been here a number of years and they've developed those skills but that's not something you would expect a tower guard to know instantly and so it's kind of a, a whole nother level yeah uh, you know once you get to that kind of stuff that story you said you know i don't know it's 38 degrees out so obviously coastal texas in the summer our water is amazing it's mid to upper 80s it's really warm water in the winter time it's a different story though we can get a lot of times the water's in the 50s and the air might be that colder colder i mean how, how much quicker does hypothermia and, and these other disorientation, these other stressors happen in the wintertime? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like my friends that are in this business in the East and West Coast are really shocked by how our water varies. And so they think because it's 88 degrees in the summertime in the water temp, that in the winter it's going to be 70 and it, because they, they think of like big deep bodies of water and the gulf is really shallow and so the air temperature can have a huge effect currents can have a huge effect and so the temperature fluctuates quite a bit here so you know I, I, I you know I've been surfing here when it was in the 30s the water temp uh, where, where, which is unbelievable when you look at the difference between 38 degrees and like 88 degrees or something like that well you go to like the west coast with the California current coming down it, it never what I mean the summer it's what mid 60s yeah. the winter might be what mid to upper 50s 
50. Maybe, I mean, they, they might yeah, have this 10 yeah, degree yeah, swing. We yeah. here we're looking at at least a 30 plus degree yeah, swing, it's, right? It's, 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 it's a huge. Whole another thing, right? Like it really is. And so, and, and I think the the first piece of you know about hypothermia, the, the one of the main things to know is that any water that's below your body temp can cause hypothermia. So like these people in the summertime that get stuck out there for a day or something like that, two days, you know, they can suffer from hypothermia, very severe hypothermia in, in 84 degree water. I mean, it, it, I see, because it, it prolonged time in the water. Yeah. It's, it's about the water temp, your body mass and, and, and how long, and how long it is. The time is a big factor too. And so, you know, you can jump in the water, you know, and you can be in cold water for 10 minutes or real cold water and you're going to get out and be fine. You can get in hot water, you're there for two hours, you'll be fine. But if you go 20 minutes in the cold water, it's a whole different deal. Or in the hot water for you know a long time, it can be a big thing. So it, it also is important to remember that water conducts that heat away from your body way faster than air does. And so your core temp can drop very quickly and you know your level of consciousness can alter like almost instantly. And so when you find yourself having trouble buttoning things or thinking what your next step is going to be, um, you know, that's, that's hypothermia setting in and, and you can be out there having a really good time surfing or swimming or whatever, wearing a wetsuit. And all of a sudden you're like, what do I need to, and you, you feel yourself getting foggy. That's the early onset, you know. So it's not just a physical thing. It can also start to really affect your mind. No, in fact, that's the first way to tell if people are affected as a, as a med, for medical invention is do they have a reduced level of consciousness? So if they're a little slow in their responses or they're not remembering things they should remember, that's probably a, a, a early warning sign that, you know, it, you, they're starting to enter into that. We hadn't talked about this previously before, but what about like dehydration? I mean, our sun angles are incredibly high here in the summertime. Mm-hmm. It's very hot. I know people generally have a car here, but what if they get out in the water for hours and they're, have you seen cases where people are completely dehydrated and maybe how does that affect them physically and mentally? Yeah, we, we deal with um, a ton of heat exhaustion every summer and this summer has been especially bad. We've had a heat advisory out now for like three weeks uh, and, and it's been, you know, temperatures up in Houston have been you know in the triple digits like pretty consistently. So heat exhaustion is very common here. It's really important that you seek shade periodically, that you cool yourself, that you are very hydrated going into it that you realize that some liquids are not going to help you remain hydrated alcohol um, especially right actually big one. yeah yeah d- Al- makes you worse right yeah it can, it can actually exacerbate the the problem and so you can be a, a little bit dehydrated and start drinking beer and then you're really dehydrated and don't realize it because you keep drinking the water and you know all that kind of stuff and so um you know you want to watch for those signs and those signs again are level of consciousness change uh, which is a big one um, but you also like they talk about cold, clammy, kind of sweaty skin as being one of the things feeling dizzy or disoriented, which would be about level of consciousness. Those are the, the heat exhaustion signs. But that can progress to heat stroke. And he, once you're at heat stroke, if you start talking about hot, dry skin, going unconscious, that kind of thing, that is like a very critical, critical life threatening thing. So if you're talking about heat exhaustion, what you really need to do is cool down, get, get yourself cool somehow. Right. And then, you know, kind of look at you, what, what your intake has been with food and water and that kind of stuff. Um, and you seek medical help if you feel like, you know, it's, it's pretty extreme. But once you get to the hot, dry skin, you encounter somebody like that, that is like they need to go immediately to the hospital. That's gotcha. not – this, no, this can be a life or death issue. And they can die right in front of you. And, and so we've seen that a number of times out here too where people are running or, you know, whatever. P- playing soccer on the sand something thinking like that. they're doing good. You yeah. Know, and, yeah. Something I learned from years now of playing sports out in, a, in this very hot, humid environment is mm-hmm. if I show up dehydrated, it doesn't matter even how much water I'm drinking during that no. soccer or ultimate yeah. – you have to stay ahead of it, right? Yeah, you can't stay ahead of it so it, once, once it kicks in. Once it kicks in, yeah. You, it's like you're an endurance athlete. And yeah. you, if you don't go preloaded, yeah. then it's you got to hydrate through through the whole day, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chief Davis, any last thoughts you'd like to share on the coastal environment, water safety? I mean, any last take-homes that you would share for people coming to the beach? Yeah, I think generally, you know, if, if you just kind of think of general safety tips, and we have great ones on GalvestonIslandBeachPatrol.com. We have a ton of stuff. And then in the, the USLA.org is that national group that I talked about, and they've got they, they actually mirror what we've got too um, but it's it's important to kind of remember the just general safety stuff like if you come and you're going to have fun do your prep beforehand like make your plan and you know that kind of stuff pack your bag and bring the stuff that you might need and so just kind of think about finding a lifeguarded area to swim in swimming near a lifeguard avoiding any structure like a pier or jetty so you stay away from rip currents keep your eyes open for warning signs and flags and all the kind of stuff we do to try to notify the public um, and we didn't talk about this, but if you're with a group, particularly if they're children, you should designate a water watcher who 
has no competing responsibility. And so they're not drinking, they're not reading, they're not listening to music, they're just sitting and watching. They don't have to be the one that makes the rescue, but they should be the one to see the early warning signs of things starting to go wrong. You know, as I've traveled around the coastal environment from Florida to Texas along the Gulf Coast, a lot of the stories I hear of people getting into trouble are like six, seven, eight-year-olds. Is part of that like, uh, you know, a one-year-old, your, your eyes are fixed on them. A 19-year-old, they're a little bit bigger and stronger. It, are there issues sometimes with those elementary age, you know, kids where, it, oh, they're probably okay, but all of a sudden, you know, they were in waist deep water and now they just went into a trough or something like that. It, it, and maybe there isn't a designated watcher, you know, for yeah. say like a five-year-old. Yeah, I think that the stuff that we see with kids here um, and elsewhere is usually a lack of attention, lack of supervision. But it is pretty rare to have a drowning of a young child in the beach. I mean, usually even young kids are pretty smart about not going into waves that are over their head and stuff like that. If you look at it worldwide, if you look at drowning, um, it, it's really weird. There's three kind of categories. One is uh, toddlers when they first start walking and they just waddle over to some kind of water, well, tub, you know, whatever, and they fall, fall in. in it, right? And then, and that's one we're all kind of tuned into then the next one is the area the age you're talking about which is four five and six year olds where they start running around in packs and maybe the adults don't watch them as close and they're way more mobile and stuff like that and that 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 is a big issue worldwide with that and so um you know and then we have the the group that we worry the most about on the beachfront which is i hate to break it to you gentlemen but men are a lot dumber than women and so it's 15 to 22 year old wild men syndrome guys it doesn't it cuts across every race race ethnicity i mean it, it's it's just a dude thing and so if you look at drowning stats anywhere for open water it's mostly guys and they're mostly that those age groups not really, all, like 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 late teens this is getting into that like you said 15 to 22 male yeah. mostly yeah exactly is it just kind of like they're they're way beyond their limitations and they're not they're not connecting it mentally <laughs> their, their brains can't keep up with their bodies and the other thing too is you know they're so competitive and they're they're moving in packs and so ones that don't swim as well are trying to keep up and all that stuff and so the way to combat this i think is is the same as the public health perspective of herd immunity and so if you get the water safety information out to kids at a young age then even if they haven't had it their friends might and they're out there with their friends and they're going to stay safe because the friends are going to be like hey let's move away from these rocks hey let's stay over here let's. i see they're, they're they're getting the info through their friends exactly. and sometimes your friends are cool but an adult isn't cool or whatever exactly, so exactly. it seems like educating that, that yeah and so purpose. creating a herd immunity is way more than a lifeguard program this is help from all adults yeah. all teachers and that. even all kids where they're they're spreading this information yeah. um and so you know on our on our website we have all this information that can be spread we've yeah. got downloadable stuff videos it's all on there and so if you go to Galveston Island Beach Patrol.com that's a great starting place if you want to help awesome. create that herd immunity uh, yeah. and, and make thank our you. job easier <laughs> and thank you Chief Davis for coming on this podcast I mean this is really good education a lot of our listeners are very outdoorsy people a lot of them are at the beach so I think what, what we covered here will help them no matter where they're at in the coastal environment and also just a big thank you too I mean Galveston has this robust tourism economy and I think the backbone for that really is the beach and you know how many millions of people come here every year so uh, just thank you to you and and the Beach Patrol and all the great work that y'all are doing. Best wishes the rest of the season. I'm hoping that we don't get any big storms or any name storms or anything out there. But um, there's, thanks for taking time today and just for the, this education. I think this is, this will really be a great podcast episode with our listeners. Very much appreciated. The great questions, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to y'all again soon. Wow, what an action-packed episode. Chief Davis taught us a lot about both the coastal environment and practical life skills that extend far beyond the coast. Here are a few of the big take-home points that I got from this interview. For the coastal environment, rip currents are the biggest danger by far. He said that rip currents are responsible for 80% of the water rescues, both nationally and internationally. The best thing you can do to avoid rips is not swim near obstructions like piers, rock groins, and jetties that stick out into the water. If you do get caught in a rip, don't try to fight the current. Either swim parallel to the shore to escape the rip or relax and go with the flow. The current will usually lose its force relatively quickly, and then you can usually walk back in, swim to safety, or signal for a rescue. As far as other life lessons that extend well beyond the coast, two points really stood out to me on this podcast. The first one is the value of collaboration. Chief Davis shared how collaborative life-saving is today and how Galveston Beach Patrol learned lessons from international locations like Veracruz, Mexico, who have brought together 10 to 15 organizations to share resources and better respond in a collaborative way. 
He said those lessons were applied in Galveston after Hurricane Ike struck in 2008, which required collaboration among many organizations to respond to the overwhelming needs. A second take-home lesson that applies to all of us relates to how well Chief Davis is prepared for all possible contingencies. He shared how he'll always take a compass when he goes out into deeper water. He mentioned that several times dense fog banks have moved in, blocking the sun and requiring him to use a compass to help him get back to shore. That's a good lesson on being prepared for potentially dangerous situations, even if they're improbable. Our goal for this podcast is to help expand your world and connect you with new thoughts and ideas that can be applied to your life to make yourself more resilient. Our podcasts always tie back to extreme weather, disasters, and hazards, but often expose our listeners to people, environments, and perspective that they've never heard before. Our hope is for an episode like this that perhaps an emergency management coordinator in Oregon applies a lesson about teamwork or preparing for all contingencies, even if her day-by-day job duties are very different than a lifeguard on the Texas coast. A special thanks to our listeners for making our community so great. We continue the conversation on social media after each episode. You can find us on the Facebook group called GeoTrack the Community. Hey, this episode was recorded live in Galveston, Texas on the island where I live. Chief Davis didn't make a mistake when he said that 7 million visitors come to our island every year. It's a beautiful, historic, tropical island that's a great vacation destination. Come visit us sometime. On behalf of the GeoTrek production team, this is Dr. Hal Needham. I'll catch you on the next episode of the GeoTrek podcast.